What may have seemed to look like a cool hack to get instant rank and reviews can be illegal if you're not careful. Learn the rules, follow the rules, and stay out of trouble. Always ask and answer the question, is this providing good or unique value to the Amazon shopper? Welcome to the Day 2 Podcast. Today's episode, Don't Get bounty fold. We're talking variations, multi-packs, bundles with our in-house experts, Malia and James. What's allowed, what's not allowed, and how not to get an FTC fine. Amazon sellers have known for years that variating products is a great way to borrow rank and reviews from an existing top selling product. Amazon even allows you to share reviews across variants. But did you know that the FTC could wreck your business with enormous fines if you don't follow TOS or for that matter, the law. I'm Jason Boyce, founder and CEO of Avenue 7 Media and host of the Day 2 Podcast. With me today is the Director of Presence at Avenue 7, Malia Kim, Head of Catalog at Avenue 7, James Fort Bay. Thanks for joining Day 2 today, you two. There's a lot of twos in that statement. How are things? Great. Great. Things are great. Awesome. Well, I know you guys are busy running around with your hair on fire. In fact, James, yours burnt off. It's gone. Uh, <laughs> Thank you guys for joining so we can help some sellers out today and really excited to dive into this topic today, Millie and James. I want to review something we talked about previously on an episode where we were really concerned about FBA orders, Malia. I think we were one of the first and few to say, hey, there's a problem. FBA orders are getting backed up and they're not leaving the FBA warehouse, causing a host of problems and causing cancellation or canceled orders. It kind of tied in with Andy Jassy's report in his annual letter, how they were optimizing FBA. I just want to check in before we dive into this episode, Malia. Are we still seeing backed up orders? Has this problem gotten any better? And where are we at? Last recommendation on the call was looking into in-stock head start and the implications of massive pending orders. Um, For some of our clients, we were 1,300 orders deep. For our clients, (laughs) we were in the 500 ranges. Like It was was phenomenal. Um, And the, the impacts were not only having these pending orders that were then, you know, promised to customers who had paid for them, who had gone in and and wanted to purchase them and then have been waiting for them. Um, It was actually putting things into a pending hold for inventory. It was looking like false sales. And so then when they would actually cancel, our account managers would go in and be like, where did these phantom sales go? It was a bad time where we were like, what's happening with this data? It would just disappear. So that's, you know, obviously problematic for a multitude of reasons. Um, and that in-stock program, happening. again, that, just yeah. by way of reminder for our listeners who may have missed the previous episode, I highly recommend going back to it and listening to it again or listening to it for the first time. But that in-stock Head Start program was meant to uh, turn a product live once the shipping shipping plan shipment was executed and there was inbound inventory to an FBA center. So you're not going to get the prime delivery promise. It's going to take a little longer to deliver, but at least that listing would go live. I liked it because it maintained that rank a little better, but that thing ran amok, amok brands being auto-enrolled in this thing and 1,300 orders getting backed up, wreaking havoc on sales numbers, on inventory numbers, pissed off customers, et cetera. We went through all of our 100 plus clients and turned it off for all of them. Are you seeing any more issues with this? on the in-stock Head Start program. Like I was saying, the, the orders were in the, you know, the thousands. Um, they have dropped significantly to like 80, 90% in some cases where we've had like 700 pending orders back in April, mid-April. Now we're down to, you know, 50. Um, in some cases, we're down to the single digits, which is amazing. We do still see some residual impacts where pending orders are being difficult to cancel. So we are actively still working on those. <laughs> Uh, with Amazon. And just so you guys are aware, even though it's not visible in your pending orders filter, you're going to actually have to go into your orders filter and then look for those ones that are in pending status, right? Disconnect there to see if there are any that are actually not even pulling into the correct dashboard and then looking at it by age. So there are some that are hiding um, that are not being pulled into the correct buckets into your orders portal. So just some golden nuggets there for how to look for anything that's outside of the ordinary or could have, you know could be residual from turning off uh, in stock Head Start. Amazon will not auto cancel for some instances, and they get stuck. There are quite a few um, that are that are remaining that we have to 
manually open cases by order with Amazon. Um, although the policy is it is supposed to auto cancel after, you know, 20, 20 something days, we're seeing we can't actually file those until after 30. And then we're having to push even those through. Uh, well, great job cleaning that up. It sounds like if we're down to 89%, because we started turning off this in-stock Head Start program for all of our clients, any of them automatically get enrolled again? Have you guys seen any of that? Okay, so far so good. I'm knocking on, I'm knocking on wood over here. No, James, is that what you said? No, no, no. I, I haven't seen any. It's just, you know, that that hard point that Malia indicated. It's um, Amazon's term of service that does indicate after a certain period of time they should be canceling them. There's a flaw in that design logic because it does not happen. I've seen ones that have been three or four months and the clients are like, what the heck's going on here? And, you know, again, I know, uh, you know, Malia and you know, the performance and policy has had to step in and really have to twist Amazon's arm to say, what the heck is going on? So it makes it difficult because you as a seller, if you don't know where to look, and I will say, don't be faked out by awaiting pay uh, payment verification. That's the status Amazon puts them under, and then they'll sit for three or four months, and you're like, uh, it doesn't take long that long from you know a credit card to go through. So just something else to be forewarned about. Unless you're processing that credit card via Pony Express. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's great. And, you know, by the way, James, I was one of those that Malia came at and said, you need to get over your ranking stuff, Jason. This is causing heartache. So she convinced me it was painful, as you can imagine, James, but uh, she was running mm -hmm. as usual. <laughs> you know, what about the actual FBA performance? Have you guys seen, I mean, obviously those pending orders are coming down, but what was the most shocking to me wasn't this in stock Head Start program that was run amok. But there were also legitimate orders where the client was in stock where pending orders were just stacking up. Has that dissipated at all, team? I think it has somewhat. It's still an issue where I see it. But again, Amazon will always tell you it's a glitch. And I'm like, eh, okay, there's been a lot of glitches in the last four or five months. I know Malia will uh, comment on it as well. But yeah, it's still we're still working through it. We're continuously tracking the trends um, and looking at the FCs specifically to see, you know, what are some of the strategies of what types of products we should send to what FC if we have the ability to choose because they all behave differently. Um, they all have different staff, right? We hope they have, all have the same policies, but we know that's not always the case. Uh, we still do see some issues with large issues, um, even small issues. So we have strategies there for our, our clients to for best practices on how to get them received, accepted, and then um, an easy way for FBA to train them out. So if you're experiencing those, you can definitely come to us and we can have a chat about that. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. I got to tell you guys, I panicked when I started to see those numbers. I'm like, you're breaking the prime promise. And that prime customer is what makes Amazon, along with the sellers and the brands that sell on that platform, what make it happen. They were really upset in both of those groups. I, I, another thing I really don't like but Wall Street loves this move, this efficient FBA model. Wall Street really loves it. What I don't like about it is if you haven't done what you just described, Malia, in making sure you're strategically, geographically placing inventory where it's in demand, you may not get your product served in the search results in a current region. And if that happens to be the Northeast, you're going to feel pain and suffering in your sales. You're going to lose revenue. So kudos to you and Nicole and the team over there for making sure that clients are getting their inventory placed in the appropriate place. I'm, I'm really glad this has a mushroom cloud and I'm glad it's getting better. Hopefully over time, they'll get this resolved. That way, Wall Street can be happy and, and we can all be happy as well. But great catch and great, great resolution. Let's dive into this episode. I'm going to start with this story. It was from back in March. I'm, I'm reading it here. The FTC in February, um, the Bountiful Company and FTC settled on a fine and it was the first I had ever seen. Frankly, it's the first case that the FTC had ever brought against a seller. And what did the FTC sue Bountiful Company for? Review hijacking, they called it, for a variation strategy that's been going on on Amazon for decades with millions of listings, maybe billions. Malia, in your mind, what made what Bountiful did different from the average rank bumping variation? The FTC actually used hijacking in a different way we normally do for Amazon. So from a performance and catalog perspective, when we talk about hijacking, we're actually talking about a seller coming in with the intention of taking and cleaning out a listing and putting their information in there and making a completely different listing. 
what Bountiful did, according to this filing from the FTC, is they've taken a product, they varied it, and from their definition, it is materially different in the terms of ingredients. Um, and so on Amazon, when you variate, you're actually supposed to vary with products that are related to one another. So that's a very gray area definition. But really, it should have the same intent, function, um, and they should not be easily differentiated by each other except for maybe size and color. Um, and again, that's still a gray area. But in terms of ingredient base, that's pretty clear cut, right? So for these, it should really just be quantity and and nothing else. You're like review hijacking. That's not review hijacking. This is review hijacking. So you know they they're not using the uh, the internal Amazon terms or the or the Amazon seller terms for sure. The thing that I scratch my head about, folks, was Amazon is the one that allowed this, right? They're the ones that allow a new variation to be attached to a parent, and. It's their technology that shares the review for the first variant with the second variant. And they're not mentioned anywhere in here other than it being the platform. And I'm going to get a bunch of hate mail from saying this out loud, Malia. But if Amazon wants to do the right thing and they want to protect other sellers from not getting bountiful, I don't think they should let you share reviews among variants. If they do that... I'm not a lawyer, but I don't think Bountiful gets sued. You've got a you got a morning formula, you got a night formula. Sure, they're variated, but the reviews would be specific to that variant. Do you have any thoughts on that, Malia? I mean, like I said before, there's definitely a gray area on how Amazon defines um, variation relationships, and so they keep it very high level. It has to be related to one another. Okay, well, what does that mean? Right, size, color, flavor. That's still pretty high level in terms of not getting into the ingredient specific based on different attributes. Again, which attributes should matter for the different categories? And then should they be on the same product detail page? Well, if they're complementary, yes, but then it kind of bleeds into should it be bundled then, right? But people probably don't want to buy two things. They maybe just want to try one. So, and James is shaking his head yes. Um, so it's definitely a gray area and it does. You can squeak by um, to try it. So I, I think, yes, you're right, Jason. If if Amazon and the FTC are really going to crack down on this, they really need to block and somehow vet what is the definition of what should be variated based on what attributes and values and what should not. You know, 5,000 sellers just decided that I'm their new enemy by saying that out loud. Because, you know, this has been an effective strategy since day one. I mean, I used it back in the day as a big seller you know, I try not to be too blatant about it. And it was even the policy sort of came after I had been using it for a long time. And so, by the way, what 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 is the variation policy? How What's the best way to be compliant with this? So the variation policy, again, is, is kind of things that I went over. They vaguely say related to one, o- one another. They can't have really too many different attributes, but, you know, they'll allow size and color. Really, what what are all those attributes that are allowed to be different? Um, they have to be fundamentally the same uh, in their function. Um, they can't be easily differentiated. So the the main example Amazon gives is, well, you have a V neck shirt. It's all in hundred percent cotton, right? It's all in the same size, maybe a different size because size is allowed. And then you have ten different colors. So that would be kind of their poster child of what a variation should be. Um, if it's a different blend, then technically that should be a different variation because that would make it. Um, you know, a little bit different. But sometimes they just squeak it in and be like, well, maybe I want like a poly cotton blend. We could probably variate it because it would probably allow us to do so. If you are allowed to sell it under the same title, except maybe changing the color or the size and everything else is the same, that would be a good measure as to whether or not it should be variated. Malia, I grabbed this definition, which basically covers what you just said. Variations, also known as parent-child relationships, are sets of products that are related to one another in terms of size, color, flavor. I mean, it doesn't say quantity, but I think that's fair. Good variation relationship listings allow buyers to compare and choose products based on different attributes as a size, color, or other characteristics from the available options on a single product detail page. I don't know. I, don't, I mean, that was the most that I could find from Amazon's TOS 
I feel like Bountiful got screwed. It's very interesting. There was no case law on this. No, FTC had never filed a case on this. Amazon has no... I mean, they're kind of complicit in this because they're allowing the sharing of, of variations. But James, what are your thoughts on this whole thing and the policy and what it... You, you, you see a lot of catalog problems uh-huh. day in and day out here at Avenue 7. How many times do you see these kind of problems come through where you look at the listing and go, oh, this listing is going to get flagged because this teddy bear has a variation that's a bunny rabbit and a duck stuffed animal, right? And that's a problem. How many? How often do you see this, James? It's, um, Jason, it's fairly often. And what happens, you know, obviously Amazon's an ever-changing environment. You can never get them structurally sound. So it makes it difficult. The way they typically define it is like uh, Malia indicated, these products are virtually the same um, and only uh, differentiate by like a size, a color. But Amazon also changes their product categories. And that's one of the uh, key components. You know, everything should be in the same category where like Malia said, hey, if it's, um, you know, to your point, Jason, the teddy bear, um, brown, blue, black, red, green. And that's how a variant, you know, uh, uh, variants are defined. However, as they review it, sometimes it changes. So it's, they are complicit because a lot of times they change stuff. No one knows. And it's like, Hey, when did this change? And I've seen this so many times in, you know, speaking to support and I look at a listing. I'm like, how are these actually variated together? And it's one of those don't get caught. But when you do, it's a problem. <laughs> so that's kind of, you know, what happens. And it's not fair to sellers, obviously. And that's why it's like important that it's like, uh, I think Amazon should really define how they determine what's variated, their terms of service, what's allowed and what's not. That's that gray area because at the end of the day, Amazon's making money. So they're going to let it go, you know, unfortunately. And then when they see something that doesn't make sense, it's like, oh, well, we got to take you down. And it's not always accurate. So, Or if the FTC comes knocking, they just take you down and ask. Yeah, you're right. Mm Mm-hmm. I want to I want to double back on something you said. Are you saying you've seen Amazon unvariate and revariate products that don't meet its own TOS requirements? Absolutely. And that's some of the uh yeah. On, that's really? you know, I'll probably get hate mail now too, but that's oh, yeah. part of the problem. You're, you're going to get on the same uh, <laughs> that I'm on, Jim. And I experience, yeah. It's like, hey, 3 days ago you said this is all right. Then you do your, you know, your bots flag and all that stuff and I'm like, nope. Um, they'll take a listing down and you're like, why? These are all the same product. They just, they just differentiate by color. And they're like, no, it doesn't meet our terms of service. I'm like, and I've had conversations where I'm like, do you guys understand your terms of service? And it's like, that's a different conversation, but it's, it happens. So yeah, it is, you know, it's, uh, intriguing, I should say at the least. <laughs> that's pretty incredible. Okay. So some best practices here. We talked about a lot of these million jams. You know, don't list a different product together, but it sounds like you also need to check your listings. I mean, obviously we've built our tech so we can see when listings are devariated, variated and all this stuff so that we can get a heads up uh, for our clients. But what's best practices, James and Malia, for how often a brand should look at their listings to make sure either A, they're not in violation already after you hang up on this podcast sellers go check your listings immediately but after that what's a what's an cadence that they should focus on me personally and you know i let malia weigh in um just because it changes so much you have to do it at least monthly probably bi-weekly because you never know what amazon's going to say it's tough and that's why to your point jason uh, i think technology is very important to keep on top of this because it's mind-boggling how much work you have to put in to make sure you know Hey, my listing was selling 10,000 last month. Now the next week, all of a sudden it's down. What happened? So I know Malia will weigh in that from a, you know, performance and policy standpoint, but you know, I'm maybe I'm maybe a little overcautious, but you know, that frequency has to be pretty often unless you just want to lose money. And I don't think any sellers want to do Nobody wants to do that. And by the way, James, Malia jumps in there. I think that's all the trigger, right? You come in and you look at your sales every day. Sellers are great at looking at that. If you see a big dip in sales, it could be your catalog issue. It could be a listing problem. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Right? Okay. That's great. Malia, anything to add to that? Yeah. So here at Avenue 7, uh, we actually 
go a little bit beyond that. So we obviously look at profitability first. So why is the impact uh, or what is the impact and what are the root causes? And our team goes in every day and we monitor and touch the, the accounts to see what's happening in performance, what's happening in policy, right? Do you have anything going on in your account health page? So if you do have a listing violation, which this would fall under, it will be on that page. And you can see through your performance notifications what exactly has happened. So if Amazon has taken your listings and you know broke them apart, that will be the trigger there. You should also go and check your managed inventory. So we will go in and, and look um, and then flag what's happening. Pass over to our catalog team, which is headed by James here. And then they'll look into, well, was this an Amazon mistake? Should it be variated based on you know their great TOS and policy? Or is this something where we should probably look and explore into a different strategy for category and variation types? You know, it's funny. I was talking to a brand just this morning, a potential client, and they've, they've got a Shopify store. And I said, here's the thing you need to understand about Amazon. Shopify is not going to take your listing down. They're not going to mess with your listing. They're not going to break your listing. They're not going to call you guilty and then make you prove your innocence on your listing. And it's just a shame that we have to do all that. But I... Team, I appreciate every day all the hard work that you guys do to make sure that our, our clients are are um, they have their presence uh, in the right position, right? Their their listings are in good, healthy shape so they can continue to grow and sell. Question, Malia, you brought this up in the pre notes, and you said at this time bundles may not be part of a variation family. So let me let me give you a, let me give you an example, and you tell me if this is what you mean. I, I'm selling a razor. And so that's my main variant. And now I'm going to sell a razor combined with shave cream as a second variant. And then the third variant, I'm going to sell a razor, a shave cream, and moisturizer. Are you saying that that's not allowed by TOS right now? Yes. So if you go to the seller help pages for variations, variations are not supposed to include bundles at all. That's interesting. Do you guys see Amazon enforcing this policy? Are you got, do you have folks coming in, both external and our existing clients, where this is a problem? Yes, I do see it. Um, and it's like I said before, it's okay until you get caught. And Amazon, <laughs> you know what I mean? They don't really strategize effectively for the sellers on their platform because, you know, like Malia said, it's not like they give you um, an intuitive description of, what you need to do to prevent this from happening. It's like, you know, and I, I've heard this so many times before over the years that, hey, I've been selling these products, you know, together for five or six years. And I'm like, well, now that Amazon has caught up to you, it's a problem. And that's what's, you know, um, disheartening to a lot of sellers. We don't want them to continue doing it and get caught, but that's a common complaint that we hear a lot, right? I've been doing this for years. What do you mean I can't do it anymore? But it's Amazon's world. We just live in it. They catch up to you. Enjoy the ride while it lasted. And now it's time to follow the rules. And Malia, you're so great, especially when we're onboarding new clients, going through and telling clients, hey, you're kind of breaking the rules here. We probably should fix this now so that you don't have a heartache later. And those are sometimes some difficult conversations, right? It's not a question of if, but when. And it's always a risk. So we always do the evaluation and we give them a risk um, and a path forward of what and how it should be um, outlined on Amazon in terms of, you know, catalog. And again, that's where we bring in James to really dive into, well, what are some other options, right, for strategy of what you could do with this category? Or maybe there's a, a better category that it's, um, you know, going to sit better within for the variation goal and how you're trying to present your products. It can go way deeper depending on what the product is, uh, what the end goals are. Um, but it is my job specifically to make sure that you are following policy. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And you do a great job. I think folks feel like, uh oh, I'm in trouble whenever you talk to them. It's great. And James, you know, I say this in the most loving way possible. You are the most annoying person to Amazon out there next to maybe me. You are just relentless. And, you know, I'm reminded, James, of uh, I, I was on a panel at the pro one of the early Prosper shows and, and someone um, came up and asked a question. Hey, I've sent this ticket. And it's not getting resolved. I mean, well, how many times did you send it? Did you send it 30 times? Did you send it 60 times? Because don't stop. Be relentless. Be like the Terminator. You're like the Terminator, James, <laughs> in a good way. You just will not stop until the client gets fixed. Uh, so I love that. James, another question for you. 
are there certain product categories? Obviously, Bountiful is in a very competitive space. Supplements, maybe the most competitive space, maybe that and pets. But are there certain categories that you can think of where you see the most bad variations or where you see you get a lot of inbound traffic to correct? It's tough, but even um, the ones you mentioned, Jason, you know, outdoor, sports and outdoor, automotive, that really gets convoluted because, you know, what Amazon pulls in as far as their their rev share, you know, I might not be using the right terminology, but their percentage to sell on their platform, there's definitely gray areas there. And, you know, some of our clients, we have seen it where it's like, hey, am I in tires and wheels or my automotive? And it's like, you took our listings down, there's nothing wrong. So that those categories that you mentioned in, you know, obviously in addition to what I mentioned are difficulties, you know, and it's like, you try to f- figure out, Amazon, what are you doing? What's the uh, golden rule? And there isn't any. Right. Everyone's like, uh, we'll get back to you. Yeah. And to add to that, so you could be listed in a category with correct variations. And then there's that annoying Amazon algorithm that will push you into a different category. Like that example, right? The outdoors. You see it time and time and again. And not only is it impacting now that you have incorrect, incorrect variations, now you're also charging a fee. So there's also that automatic algorithm that we're fighting against, which Amazon is saying, well, customers are searching this way. Well, unfortunately, customers aren't always right. Then we need to fix it and push it back. And then we fix the variation. So there are instances where they will break your variations. It's not your fault. <laughs> it is an, uh, an issue mishap, um, but it does happen. We've had to support in a lot of those cases as well. Just wrapping up the bundles for for a minute here. There's more than one way to do a bundle, right, Malia? What's the right way to do a bundle? And then if you can't do it the right way, what about these virtual bundles? For bundles, so bundles are, you know, individual products put together. You know, if you were gonna to go to like a wholesaler and you get like a game pack and want to sell the bundle, no, that's already a pre pre um packaged kit. That's not considered a bundle. You're not allowed to sell that. It's really taking individual items putting it together that are complementary. So not just like, you know, a shoe and a, you know, sunscreen or something weird and you put it together and you're like, this is my bundle. Like you technically could kind of, um, but Amazon wants them to be related or complementary. The other thing that is not allowed is a lot of the um, gaming, books, music, video, DVD, and things like that. You can bundle those products together unless they are complementary to something larger. Like let's say you have a DVD player, right? You maybe could bundle in like two CDs or something with that. That's it's still a gray area, and it does take a bit to get accepted. Um, but those, according to policy, are accepted bundles. I imagine the the one exception with the books would be like I bought a I, I bought a box set of Harry Potter books that years ago I read to my girl. So that that comes in a box set. That's probably allowed. But you can't take individual books out of there and create like a bundle on the books. I can tell you, I've been doing, I've been in this game a long time. I didn't know that. That's good information. Um, and, and in my example, my razor and uh, the shave cream and the moisturizer, those are, those could be connected, but I would have to put them in a separate box with the new UPC code and a new ASIN. Is that true? Yep. So a bundle is considered as one product. Um, so everything within that bundle has to be packaged together, can be onesie, twosies, you know, for the physical bundles. So you mentioned virtual, so we'll get there. For the physical bundles, they all have to be packaged together. So one exterior package, when I get it, I have to open the box and then it might contain like all the little things within there with one UPC as a identifier of this is this kit or this is this bundle. If I don't have the ability, and, and by the way, that's a, that's a reseller's playbook right there. You know, you buy all these different things at wholesale, you put them together, you repackage them and you sell them as a unit. Unless you have an exclusive with the manufacturer or the brand that you're buying from, I think bundles is still a reasonable game as a reseller. Short of those two things, reseller's a tough game, really tough game. Okay. So let's say I don't have the wherewithal to package these things into one box, go create the UPC code. What else can I there's the option to virtual bundle, um, but there are some eligibilities. And I, I did want to quickly go back to the physical bundles. So there are some things to think about in, sh- in terms of strategy. Uh, when you bundle, you're going to bundle based on what is the highest valued or priced item. And that's how you can brand your bundle. So that's very important. 
also whatever that product type is, that's going to be your primary product in the bundle is your category fees. So there really is a lot of strategy behind how you bundle and when you bundle just to take that into consideration. And that's exactly how the virtual bundles work as well. So to in order to offer virtual bundles and actually be eligible, you have to have a brand. So you have to have brand ownership. If you're a reseller, that's not going to be an option for you unless you have the ability to be granted permissions to participate in that brand on Amazon. Um, so you need to have brand registry and then you also need to have FBA in stock. So those are the, the one of the two main things that you need for virtual bundles. In my example, let's say the razor's $15, the shave cream is $5, and the aftershave cream is $5. Does that mean the category has to go into razors because that's the highest ticket item in the bundle? Is that what you're saying? Exactly. Okay. Okay. Got it. So I couldn't, let's say I, I may be able to get better ranking in the aftershave category. I can't be there with the bundle. It's got to be wherever the highest priced item is. Okay. Let me ask you this. I've got three different ASINs. They're live and I want to virtually bundle them together. I've got brand registry. I've got a brand and I want to virtually bundle them together. Each of the prices are $10, $10, and $10. Can I list that virtual bundle for $35 and make an extra five bucks as I package it together? I mean, typically with that, um, it's that collective value. One of the bigger points of virtual bundles is making sure that, hey, we're putting these products together that are complementary. And there's a inherent value to someone buying them. So, you know, and Malia, I know you can weigh in on this, but I would caution against saying, hey, I want to make an extra five bucks because it's like, okay, if I bought these products separately, it's $30. Why are you charging me 35? You know what I mean? So you, you have to be aware of that. So what they do kind of indicate, again, still a gray area is, you know, collective, hey, if it's $30, fine. But what they're looking for is to say, hey, well, you guys can get this bundle for 25 or 28 versus, oh, now I'm going to charge $50 and I'm be like, that's not going to work. Okay. They won't let you go live with that virtual bundle. You got to- <laughs> Well, they may for a little bit, but uh, then yeah. you'll have to deal with uh, Malia telling you what you did wrong. <laughs> uh, nobody wants that call, James. Nobody. Awesome. All right. Well, guys, your knowledge, your support of sellers is awesome. Anything else that, any last parting shots and talking about variations, multi-packs, bundles, virtual bundles that you think would be valuable to our audience? Yeah, just on my end, um, again, Malia touched upon it, um, that continual uh, monitoring. Um, you have to keep uh, up on Amazon because they change categories. You know, that's a very important one and you have to make sure you look at your listings. I don't care what type of seller you are, you have to know your account and make sure that, hey, my top sellers, even some of my lower ones at potential, they don't get taken down for terms of service and Amazon just, you know, changing, you know, um, you know, outside of the box, if that makes sense. It does, James. And Malia, what about Vendor Central? Look, I'm a vendor. I'm selling my product to Amazon. They're not going to do anything bad to my listing, right? I mean, after all, this is Amazon retailing it. Is that true or false? <laughs> That's absolutely false. <laughs> Um, and James laughing. James is laughing because he he has had his fair share of uh, troubleshooting some of the one uh, P or vendor side. Um, the resources for help are actually not as abundant from the seller side, which is quite a shock for a lot of people who go into the vendor. Side. That's correct. So the vendor side is right. You would think would be more motivated to help the sellers because they're they're the ones yes. helping Amazon to flip the the product, right? It's not always the case. And in our experience, it almost isn't the case. Um, so for a lot of these issues, they go unflagged because the dashboard is not as visible as Seller Central. So you really have to dig and audit to find these issues, um, not just within the portal itself, but actually through the detail page, the so walking store, and then really working backwards then to work with support through vendor, uh, which is another another time for another podcast. <laughs> Yeah, right. That that's where the Terminator comes in, right? The Terminator <laughs> shit. Yeah, not noxious. It's not funny. It's really sad. When I talk to brands, they're like, "What do you mean they're not taking looking after their own listings?" I'm like, "They can't. They have a zillion brands that they have to manage. They're totally overwhelmed, understaffed, and the tech can't help them do what it needs to do." So that's why, that's why they got you guys, Millie and James. I know you guys have to say no to a lot of requests. 
well-meaning strategists and well-meaning clients. And thanks for all of your hard work on behalf of our clients as we meet our mission to change the lives of sellers and brand owners. You know, I'm pitching myself. I feel really lucky to have you guys on our team looking out for our clients all the time. So thank you for taking time out of your insanely busy days to be on the day two podcast and sharing some of your knowledge with our listeners. In the final analysis, Amazon offers some incredible ways to increase your average order value, your AOV, but make sure to do it correctly. You don't want to get bountiful and don't make that costly mistake. Now the FTC is looking and they're looking for you. So don't break the raw, don't break the rules. What may have seemed to look like a cool hack to get instant rank and reviews can be illegal if you're not careful. Learn the rules, follow the rules and stay out of trouble. But if you do cross the line and you get into bad trouble, give Malia and James a call. They will help you get out of it. Always ask and answer the question, is this providing good or unique value to the Amazon shopper? If it is and you're following the rules, you're going to be fine. If you're ready to start growing and protecting your brand on Amazon with a team of experienced Amazon operators like Malia and James, you can visit us at day2podcast.com. That's day, the number two, podcast.com. And lastly, if you know anyone else who would gain value from this podcast, please share it with them. Thanks for listening and happy selling.